what I'm going to do today um, is um, this. So first of all, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about second language education in today's world, and I'm going to tie it to uh, the, de the development of 21st century skills, uh, the idea of purposefulness and meaningfulness. And I will, will also talk about multiliteracy and multimodal literacy in connection to second language. Then I will introduce the framework, uh, learning by design. And in particular, I'm going to talk about second language learning uh, grounded in learning by design. And finally, I'm going to uh, show an instructional blueprint, uh, an example of how learning by design can be applied in the second language classroom. So if we think about, you know, um, the what, what is required from us, you know, as educators um, in today's world, um, what I always think, I, I, I always try to envision that taking into account what, you know, industry and also, uh, you know, organizations are telling us about uh, what we need to prepare our students for. And so one of the things what I'm showing you right now is um, it's a, a new infographic developed by the World Economic Forum. Uh, so it's based on research that they did with employers and they talked about what is what employers are looking for, what we need to prepare students for. So some of the uh, skills that uh, employers are looking for are, for example, analytical thinking and innovation, active learning and learning strategies, complex problem solving, critical thinking and analysis, creativity, originality and initiative, leadership and social influence, technology use, monitoring and control, technology design and programming, and also some other aspects that have to, that have to do with, of course, I mean, uh, the way in which we interact with other people. So uh, resilience, stress tolerance, flexibility. And of course, I mean, the idea of collaborating with other people is very, very important for in, in those in these particular skills. And of course, I mean, the development of a second language, we know that ACTFL talks about the combination of uh, this 21st century uh, skills with the development of the second language. So of course, I mean, if we think about uh, what employers are looking for, we need to think about um, the way we are teaching. And so we need to, to think about um, the uh, change in educational paradigm that we are seeing, that we, we've seen for a while, and we need to take into account if we want to, we need to incorporate into our classes, if we want to take into account these skills, we want to prepare our students for uh, this society. Uh, so what we have now is like, you know, we're seeing a change from, of course, I mean, education, what, uh, Copen Kalans is called uh, call Education 2.0 and in connection with Internet 2.0. And this, of course, uh, sees um, this type of education. In this type of education, le learners are seen as agents and as active participants. Uh, they are seen as knowledge producers. And they, of course, they are, instead of, you know, being, um, being asked to memorize and use, you know, in our case, language in the contextualized context, um, now students are need to, are uh, what we need to prepare them is to discover, to navigate, to critically use language, to critically use content, and also of course, I mean, um, we now have um, you know like what we have all of all of us have this you know next to to us that we are always using these uh, devices that have become cognitive prosthesis in a way you know so it's not. Um, it's not necessary for us to remember anymore, but to learn how to use knowledge. And of course, being uh, able um, you know, to use, uh, to know how to use knowledge implies that we are able to judge, to argument, to reason in terms of what we, we are exposed to and the way in which we use uh, knowledge when we communicate. So the idea is that, of course, I mean, when we are thinking about teaching, we have to move away from a cognitive focus and then it's just memorizing and not just using. And we have to uh, move towards an ergative focus. That means that, you know, you, we have to see uh, students using what they are learning in practice. So, you know, we have to see them applying what they are learning in creating artifacts, in creating knowledge, in being agents. And of course, I mean, Another important aspect that is connected to the expectations that we have now for communication is the idea of preparing learning, learners to work with others and to collaborate in the construction of knowledge. 
And of course, I mean, when we are thinking about this, we're thinking about, you know, students uh, using what they are learning, uh, working together. Of course, that involves uh, uh, feedback and uh, recursive feedback and formative feedback. So the idea is of, you know, not just having one test at the end of um, a particular, you know, uh, instructional module, but instead of finding ways of um, assessing our students while they are using the new knowledge in uh, collaborative tasks and also prayer tasks and individual tasks. So this is, you know, what we see, uh, this is the kind of education that we need in order to prepare our students for these particular skills, these 21st century skills. Now, um, all of this is also seen, you know, in the way we see language teaching nowadays. So for example, in their latest, um, uh, work on um, uh, um, practices, teaching practices. Uh, um, Gleason and Donato talk about the idea of, you know, when we are designing uh, instructional uh, context for second language uh, teaching, we have to take into account two different aspects. We have to think. Uh, uh, we have to think about, you know, the content that we're going to use and the context. So we have to think about these two, and we have to create, of course, uh, instructional materials, instructional context um, that will allow us to provide students with comprehensible, meaningful, memorable, and purposeful instruction. So when we think about that, uh, when we think about meaningful, um, we think about uh, content, we think about an instruction that is going to matter to students and will involve topics and intera interactions to which students can relate. So this is extremely important. So our interactions should be connected to our students' uh, life world. So this is for, for our teaching to be meaningful to them. And also important is the idea of um, creating instructional context in which there is a reason for student learning and there's a goal to achieve. So there should be a reason for students to use the second language and there should be uh, an important a uh, goal to achieve for them for the use of the second language. Now, all this, all, the, all this, you know, is something that we've seen for a while. You know, we've talked about being, you know, um, meaningful and meaning, being, you know, purposeful in connection with communicative language teaching, for example. Now, one thing that we are seeing that is different now is the fact that, you know, we don't just communicate with language. So our communication is multimodal. So we use, we always use, like in this case, for example, I mean, uh, yes, I am using language, but I'm, uh, I'm using the oral mode of communication, but I'm also using the written mode of communication because you see the written language. And I'm also using the visual mode of communication. I can see you guys and you can see me. And at the same time, I'm using the gestural mode of communication too. So our communication is never really linguistic, just linguistic. So the idea is that, you know, if we want to prepare our students to use, uh, to communicate effectively, we have to teach the second language in connection to other modes of communication. And this is where uh, literacy-based L2 learning comes, um, you know, comes into place. Uh, so the idea is that, of course, I mean, we have to develop the, the focus of our teaching should be Yes, the second language, but you, we should also pay attention to other ways of communication, other modes of communication. And when we are thinking about uh, developing second language learners, learners, we are not just thinking of developing their second language, but we are thinking of development, developing multiliterate second language learners. And this is when intercultural citizenship comes into play. So what, how can we define a multiliterate uh, person? So uh, a multiliterate person is someone that understands and is able to use traditional and new uh, communication technologies. So the idea is that you can uh, use, you know, the, the traditional communications technologies. You can, for example, write something, but you can also communicate effectively, effectively using other modes of communication, other semiotic systems. Also, you know, uh, a multimodal uh, and multiliterate person is able to understand how social and cultural diversity affects the ways in which we communicate. So, of course, I mean, when we are thinking of communication and the way in which someone is communicating, we have to think about who that person is, 
the connections that this person, the person has to social groups and also cultural groups. So this is very important too. Also, of course, um, we need to understand that um, there are new texts that we, we are dealing with, you know, every day, uh, new, new practices, for example, I mean, that we, we have now, we didn't used to have 10 years ago. And we have to communicate that, and we have to understand that different texts come, uh, have different purposes, have different audiences, and are used in different contexts. We need to see different texts and be, as being different, and uh, as working differently. And in order for us to understand what is being expressed, we need to understand how they work in different ways. And finally, of course, we have to understand that there's always a reason for communication. And the person that is communicating something has a motive behind their uh, communication. So there is a reason why someone chooses to communicate and there is a reason why they choose to communicate in a particular way and they choose to use uh, a particular image or a particular or particular um, structure or vocabulary. So there's always a reason behind any kind of communication. And this is what we call in semiotics, we call the motivated sign. So this is, this is extremely important when we are thinking of intercultural citizenship, it's particularly this particular uh, three aspects of multiliteracy and multiliterate communication. So when we think about intercultural citizenship, um, if we use uh, 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 Warner's et al. Uh, um, definition, we know that you know when we're thinking about intercultural citizenship, our concern is with social justice, and there's a belief in the values of humanistic thought and action. There is a questioning attitude. So we look at beliefs, we look at values, and we look at behavior. And there's also a willingness to promote social action in the world and the creation and identification with others beyond the limits of national boundaries. So the idea is, again, um, you see the connection between being a multiliterate person and then becoming an intercultural citizen. And of course, I mean, this involves uh, the the, the, the practices that are connected to these this goals are, of course, the inclusion of students in decisions about the focus of their learning. Again, so we are thinking what I've just said. Remember, the learner as agent, so this is important. Then there's also learning activities that are going to lead to engagement with people outside the classroom, so students working, not just creating artifacts in the classroom, but working with the communities outside their classrooms. And also, of course, uh, taking decisions to participate in community life outside the classroom by drawing competencies acquired within the classroom. And these competencies are not just linguistic competencies, but they are multimodal competencies. What I just said is just understanding not just how we use the second language, but Thank also you, how we use. Okay. Sorry? You are welcome. And a question? I think somebody's unmuted. I need to mute. Okay. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. So all is this. All this is very important in second language. Uh, now in our second language classes. So one way in which we can achieve these goals, we can uh, prepare students to use the second language, but also prepare students to uh, become multimodal uh, communicators, is by introducing into our second language classes a multiliteracy based uh, approach. And this is what I'm going to talk about now. So one of the, the frameworks that uh, are connected to the idea of multiliteracy is that allow that can allow us to incorporate not only the second language, but other modes of communication and also or um, critical pedagogy into our classes is learning by design. So learning by design is interpreted as an act in, in learning by design, learning is seen as an active dynamic process that reflects the knowledge processes that we uh, experience in our informal life, in our personal life. So um, these processes are uh, defined by Kalansis and Cope, the, the developers of this particular uh, 
framework as experiencing, conceptualizing, analyzing, and applying. So let's just think about before going into them, you know, connected to um, teaching and, and instruction learning. Let's let's think about a situation in in, uh, in real life. So the idea is that, you know, if we think about and we get into a social situation, and of course, when we come to the, uh, the social situation, we bring our experiences, right? What we know about the world. So we come into a new situation and we have, we activate our schemata right away. What we know about that particular, uh, the aspects of that situation based on our experience. So that is experiencing the known. So then we enter into the new situation, which is similar to what uh, we already know, but might have something new. And we interpret it and we, we uh, come into it with experiencing the know, and then we get into experiencing the new. So we are in a new situation. And then now we have to understand the new situation. So the first thing that we are going to do is to try to see how the situation is organized. I mean, what are the elements of the, those particular situation, the particular situation? So I don't know, if, for example, if I am going to, um, I am new to something. Uh, so I've got, I'm going to try to understand how, what elements are in that, this new situation and how they work. And then I'm going to try to generalize those elements to or what I already know, to the schemata that I already have. And then that is going to give me some kind of understanding of the new situation. That is conceptualizing. But of course, I mean, just looking at the structure of the situation, having a general idea of the situations is not enough. So what I'm going to do is analyze different aspects to the situation so I can feel more comfortable in it. And so one of the things is I'm going to look at how a, each element of that particular situation works. And that's going to, and I'm going to analyze those elements functionally, looking at how they work. But at the same time, if it is a social situation, then I'm going to try to understand the, understand the values that are there, right? So I'm going to see the way in which people are behaving, for example, and I'm going to try to understand the reasons why they are behaving like that and what values they are represented in their behavior. And that's going to be analyzing critically. And of course, oh, so I am in this new situation and I, I've learned a lot about this new situation. And then this knowledge that I have, I'm, I'm going to apply in a, in a similar situation when I am there, but at the same time, since I am a very different person from you know, other people in the same situation, I'm going to bring my own thing to that particular situation and I'm going to be creative. So this is how we can see that, you know, we can see that these knowledge processes are processes that we experience every day. So what Kalansis and Cope did uh, was basically to transfer them into the second, into the, sorry, into instruction, not the second language, into instruction. So, so what they think, it, what they said is that, you know, um, they, have, they have taken these knowledge processes and they have uh, created a blueprint that we can incorporate into our classes to uh, basically structure what our students do and to reflect what, they, what we do in, in, in formal learning in formal learning. So these knowledge processes are foundational types of thinking in action on th or things you can do to know. So these, uh, and then, you know, this is, uh, the, these uh, processes are both connected to uh, aspects that are uh, social and emotional in our lives. So what we know and how we, we, we use things, but uh, they're also, uh, processes that uh, reflect the way in which we understand the world from the point of view of cognition. So the, how we conceptualize things, how we uh, uh, generalize things, and then how we understand things from in, in taking into account the way they work and also uh, the values that are involved in them. So um, if we apply learning by design to our classes, um, the first thing that we have to take into account is that we need to develop 
curricula that are based on materials that are relevant to our learners, that, that are closely connected to who they are. So that's the main thing. So if we develop materials that are connected to our students' uh, life worlds, then they are going to think that they are going to feel that they belong to instruction, right? And at the same time, uh, we should also, our, our uh, curricula should also have, um, the results should be uh, our learner's transformation, not just in terms of knowledge, but also in terms of uh, people, right? So in order for that to happen, we have to create materials that are connected to our students' life worlds, to their community, to the world in which they belong. And at the same time, they allow them to critically engage with those materials. So we have to create instructions that allow for critical uh, understanding, critical engagement with the materials. But the, that critical engagement should not be too far away from our learners' reality, because if it is too far away, then the close-up transformation doesn't happen, right? And for learning to happen, we need these two principles, belonging and transformation. So if we're thinking about, so what we have here is, um, a, 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 it's a, a representation from my latest book on uh, learning by design and the elements that we find in instruction. So I will come back to this in a minute. So if we're thinking of uh, second language learning grounded in learning by design, these are some of the aspects that we need to incorporate into our classes. So we need to have dialogical collaborative teaching and learning. So teachers collaborating with students, students collaborating with one another. We need to uh, incorporate work within the knowledge processes. So students need to have activities. We have to create activities that will allow students to experience the known and the new, conceptualize uh, uh, by naming and with theory, analyze functionally and critically and apply appropriately and creatively. We also need to create instructional sequences, outcomes multi and multimodal content and tasks that are based on the subject matter that we are teaching, of course, but also on our learners' academic and personal needs. So we need to have curricular connections with learners' diverse identities, personal experiences, and community. And the most important thing, this is connected with intercultural citizenship, we need to have engaged critical citizenship. So that means that we need to uh, incorporate or create activities that allow our students to critically analyze socially relevant issues that are connected to their life world, but are also connected to the target cultures. So what, what, we, what we need to create are you know, uh, opportunities for students to work collaboratively with authentic second language texts and use their, um, their target language in the three modes of communication interpersonal, interpretive, and presentational. But at the same time, uh, learners should be working with uh, multimodal artifacts, not just things that are written, printed in language, but in, that involve other modes of communication. And they need to have the opportunities to use new media and new tools too, digital tools and media. And of course, learning uh, has to be tied to authentic text and critical inquiry. So what does that mean? All right, so now what um, uh, I, when people ask me to the, this, uh, to in a way summarize what L2 learning, grounded in learning by design looks like, I, I use a, a, uh, um, a quote from Garcia and Silva, when they say, you know, they talk about uh, an approach um, which can be defined as singularities in pluralities. So, that, and that's how I see learning by design and second language learning grounded in learning by design. It's, it's an approach that recognizes and legitimizes the singularity of the individual experiences that make up the plurality of experiences in the classroom. So the idea is that, you know, you celebrate your student's life world, uh, and, but you also celebrate their diversity. And this is a door to critical citizenship too. Because I mean, you involve your students, you bring aspects of their life world, but also you introduce 
other aspects that might be part of their life world, but they are not, they haven't looked at critically. And that's when critical uh, uh, intercultural citizenship comes into place. So now we're going to have a look at the knowledge processes. And also I'm going to show you how we can incorporate them in the, in the uh, second language classroom. But also um, I want to show you that besides uh, the involved in the knowledge processes and involved in everything that we do, the tasks that we uh, engage our students with in learning by design, we have these mini meta functions. So the idea is that when students are um, working with materials, uh, we have to create uh, ways in which they can understand uh, meaning making in comprehensively, comprehensively, sorry. So we have to think about, they should be able to understand what uh, something is about, okay? What message is being conveyed. Um, also, they have to understand agency, who or what has created the artifact or the digital environment they are working with. They also have to look at the structure, the modes of communication. So how the kind of semiotic resources that are used to, to create uh, meaning and to create internal cohesion in a particular artifact. So how the different modes of communication are combined to express that particular message, that particular, uh, um, yes, the, the particular message that the, the mini maker wants to express. They also have to understand where and when that particular artifact that they are working with or text they are working with was produced. So when we're thinking about where and when we're thinking about the social and cultural context in which it was produced. And finally, and I think this is crucial, crucial for, for uh, you know, education in our in contemporary education is understanding interest, why? So who is the uh, artifact for the audience? And in particular, what the mini maker's motivation is. So this comes into place with every day for us, right? So when someone posts something in, in social media, uh, we have to look at all this. What is being said? Who is saying that? I mean, does the person have any kind of authority or not? Um, then what kind of modes of communication? Why a particular... Um, uh, images used, why a particular structure, linguistic structure is being used, what is it that the person is trying to do, and then the context where, I mean, what, what group does the person belong to, and then in particular, I mean, what are they trying to achieve with that, the interest. So these metafunctions are also involved in uh, learning by design. These are part of learning by design. These are, these are of uh, meta functions that we need to think of when we are creating our um, materials. And now I'm going to show you a, um, an example. So in this example, what I'm going to do is to um, um, use, um, it's, it's an example from, that, I, that I created from uh, Trajectos, the book that, uh, the open book. But this is, this is extra, it's not in the book. Um, so the idea is that my objective is the development of students' multiliteracies uh, for, of course, including the, the L2. I want students, of course, to learn the second language and I want them to use it in interpretive, um, interpersonal and presentational communication. But at the same time, I also want them to understand how other modes of communication are used. And I also want to develop their intercultural citizenship. So one of uh, the topic that I have chosen is cultural appropriation, which is a very important topic. And in particular, I want them to think about the consequences of cultural appropriation, social and economic. So the instructional L2 focus is going to be a v, uh, it's going to be video comprehension and interpretation, so interpretive mostly, and then also looking at grammar and structural aspects related to expository informat information texts. Semiotic tools, I'm going to use um, a multimodal expository text because it's going to be an, a video. And I'm going to, um, students are going to look at the resources that I use, the organization, the audience and purpose. 
And then they're going to look at the second language in terms of its effectiveness in combination with other semiotic systems, images, sounds, gestures. The level of performance that I'm thinking of is intermediate, mid, and university students, but it could be adapted because a lot of the uh, analysis that you can do with a particular text when you are not focusing on um, students' production, but you are focusing on interpretive communication can be done in the first language. So what I have here is, of course, in experiencing the known, students are going to, I'm going to situate students in the topic, I'm going to activate previous knowledge, I'm going to connect the topic to previous experiences. So this, that is the point of departure, right? And it's going to be interpersonal communication. In the next step, I'm going to introduce the artifact, all right? And I'm going to ask uh, students to uh, uh, analyze the artifact. So we're going to look at the organization of the artifact, how it is organized, the semiotic tools that are used to communicate the message, the purpose, the significance, the value, the critic. I'm going to ask them to critically analyze the topic in it, from the point of view, and it, this is connected with intercultural citizenship. And of course, I'm going to use interpretive and interpersonal communication. And that is going to do be, be experiencing the new, conceptualizing, and then analyzing functionally and critically. And of course, in the last part, I'm going to ask students to, um, if this is going to be uh, presentational communication, they're going to apply appropriately and creatively. Um, probably they are going to um, produce a multimodal artifact. So they are going to use the second language in connection with other modes of communication to produce an, a multimodal artifact. All right, so let's have a look at the processes first. Um, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you the processes and then I'm going to show you an example, okay? So what we have here is experiencing the known and the new. And like I said, you know, in experiencing the known, um, what you do is like you, you activate your student's schemata. So you activate uh, your, you, your focus is your students' previous experience, their previous, previous uh, knowledge, uh, their um, community background. So you are activating the, the, um, what they know about the particular topic. So for example, you can use for this, you can use resources such as images, you can use quotes, you can use uh, word clouds. Um, so you can, you can use data charts. Um, in experiencing the new, what you're going to do is introduce the new knowledge. So you are going to immerse the students in new context. And also you are going to connect. Um, so you are going to uh, connect the, the new content to what students already know. And so some, some of the sample tasks that you can have here are brainstorming, you can have class surveys, you can have show and tell, um, knowledge journey, um, think, pair, share, comprehension and interpretation tasks. So this is all very abstract. So now let's have a look at, at an example. All right, so here, what I'm going to show you is this. So I want students to start thinking about cultural appropriation. So remember that in, in experiencing the know, what we want to do is like, we want a personal connection to the topic. We want to activate existing schemata uh, in terms of topic and language. We also, um, we want, we can organize these activities around a variety of artifacts. We can jumpstart critical analysis and depending on students' uh, levels of L2 performance, we can encourage them to use both the L1 and L2. So here what we have, are, um, so the focus could be the celebration known to uh, celebration known to students. For example, Cinco de Mayo, right? So students know the celebration and it's a celebration that is popular among university students. So what we are going to do is to reflect on the meaning of cultural appropriation based on their personal knowledge and their definition. So for example, what we can do is we can present them with these images such as these, right? So what we have, here is like, you know, we can ask them to analyze the kind of, you know, the kind of celebration, right, um, that they see, we can have, you, we can uh, also expose them to uh, a definition of cultural appropriation, 
and then we can ask them, we can guide them into the refle reflection. And so they can uh, connect perhaps the images with cultural appropriation. Or, or why would anyone could connect this, would connect these images with cultural appropriation? And then, you know, they can start thinking about the possible negative consequences of cultural appropriation. So that is experience in the known. So we know, so they are already, I mean, they are, it's, it's, a, it's a practice that they know, it's Cinco de Mayo, right? But then they start to, they, they are starting to think about, you know, how these images could be interpreted as cultural appropriation, right? So then um, once we have uh, placed students in uh, experiencing, we can start, uh, you know, we can introduce a new artifact. We'll see that in a minute. And when, when, intro when we introduce the new artifact, we can ask our students to start looking at the structure of the artifact and then what kind of meaning is expressed by the artifact. So here, what we are doing is like, you know, we are analyzing the structure and the organization of a particular artifact, okay? We are looking at the elements, what each part of the artifact conveys. And then here, after we do that, we can generalize and we can uh, think about the way the artifact is structured, the kind of, um, you know, um, meaning that is conveyed in each part of the, of of the artifact, and then we can start thinking about other artifacts that do the same. So then we can generalize about a particular type of artifact, right? So for example, I mean, uh, we, can, we can talk about, if we're using an expository text, we can talk, talk about uh, the structure of expository texts, right? So we look at the different elements and then we generalize on the structure of expository texts in general. So if we look at the example, so what we have here, students already are in experiencing the known, and now we're going to uh, place them in experiencing the new, right? So this is what we are going to use. We're going to use a multimodal um, L2 artifact on cultural appropriation. And this is a video on uh, cultural appropriation in connection with, um, with uh, seamstresses in Mexico, right? So, uh, and some of the patterns that have been appropriated from them and have been that are now used by commercial, uh, you know, brands now. So students, um, so in experiencing uh, the, the new, right? Uh, students create a, a list of things that negative aspects of cultural appropriation, right? And so what they do is like with um, the list that they create, they create it in experience in the know, this is the point of departure for looking at this particular video. So they look at the video and they, they think about some of the aspects that they created if they are reflected in the video. I mean, what are some of the negative aspects, negative consequences of cultural appropriation? So here what they do is they analyze the message conveyed in terms of com interpretation, comprehension and interpretation questions, and they look at the structure of the artifact. So how information is presented. And so um, the, the goal is of course, comprehension and interpretation tasks. For example, you can have questions, tables or visual representations. And of course, I mean, you can also, when it comes to the structure of the particular artifacts, students can have charts, they can have Venn diagrams, so they can have different, different ways in which they can uh, talk about the structure of a particular artifact. And then after this, after being exposed to the new, uh, the new elements, the new artifact, they can have a new reflection on, negative, on the negative consequences of cultural appropriation in connection with a target lab culture based on the artifact. So we started with what they know, the celebration that they know. We started um, thinking about how, you know, the way in which the Cinco de Mayo is celebrated by some um, populations in the United States might be cultural appropriation. 
And then from there, thinking about cultural appropriation, uh, the schemata are there. Then we move to the new artifact, this experience in the know, and we understand the new artifact from the point of view of the message that is being conveyed and also the structure of the artifact. So this is experiencing the new and conceptualized. So now we know, um, we know the artifact, we know the structure of the artifact, but now we want to understand the, art the artifact in more detail. So what we're going to do now is to look at the elements, at each particular element of the artifact and how the, those elements are connected to express meaning. And here is when we do analyzing functionally. So here what we analyze is how linguistic and non-linguistic features work to express specific meanings. So, um, and here is when we can look at the second language. And for example, we can talk about um, why is it that, you know, the video, um, the video producers are using questions, right? What are they trying to do with the audience? Okay, what, are, what kind of meaning are they, are they trying to convey? Well, perhaps they are using questions because they want the audience to uh, reflect, right? To think about those, right? Um, why are they using the present tense? Okay, well, uh, because they are informing, you know, this is an expository text. So you are giving information. So really we don't need a, we're talking about things that happen all the time. No, so we, we need the present tense. So this is how you organize, you analyze uh, functionally. You also analyze, for example, uh, images. Why is it that um, they have used a particular kind of font? Why is it that they have used a particular kind of uh, color, okay? So this is how you analyze functionally. You connect elements to meaning, okay? But also important is not just uh, connecting elements to meaning, but also connecting elements to the meaning maker. So in analyzing critically, you look at those elements and you, the question is why? So what is this video? Who is this video for? Who is the audience, right? Who is the meaning maker? I mean, who has produced this video? What are they like? What is their intention? What is, what is their motivation, right? And what is it that is telling us about the target culture, okay? And what is it that is telling us about the audience, right? So they use Spanish in the video. So that means that it is uh, probably for a Spanish speaking audience, okay? But then who are, the people in the particular audience. So this is analyzing critically. Now, in analyzing critically, um, when, so then what you look is um, the functions, but also you look at analytical perspectives and lenses. So here, the uh, meaning is analyzed in terms of semiotic resources and the meaning maker. So students focus, like I said, on, second la on the second language, on vocabulary or grammar, the connections between meaning and form, the focus on ways to communicate information. Uh, there's also the analysis of other semiotic resources in terms of audience and purpose and the focus on meaning, and meaning makers, who they are, what their purpose is, and why they have produced the artifact and for whom. Now, in this case also, you can, in this particular knowledge process, you can also introduce a new artifact. And in this case, for example, if your purpose is for students to think about, um, so what you have is like, you know, intercultural citizenship and you're, you want your students to think about uh, cultural appropriation, you want to focus on the target culture, but you also want to think about their own culture. And here, for example, you can introduce a new artifact. And what I have here is a video from PBS that is um, titled, What is Cultural Appropriation? So what students can do is to watch this particular video. It's in English, which is great, it's fine. And they can talk about, they can compare, right? Cultural appropriation in terms of their own culture and also the target cultures. So for example, they can compare, you know, they can, they can think about similar social groups 
because I mean the 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 target artifact was about uh, you know native Mexicans. And then this particular uh, video, it's a PBS video, deals with Native Americans and the use of Native Americans in, you know, Hollywood, the representation, and also, uh, for example, uh, football teams, right? Mascots. So then um, here with, um, they can critically compare and they can uh, think about cultural appropriation as being uh, an issue, a socially important issue that not only affects target cultures, but also affects uh, groups in their own cultures. So this is, this is the way in which you join them. And then that's the critical analysis. So then based on this work with these two artifacts, they, then they revise again, or they go back to their reflection and they think about new ways uh, they have a new reflection on the consequences of cultural appropriation in connection to the affected groups, okay? And how the, the, those consequences affect groups, not just from a social point of view, identity, but also from a financial point of view. And finally, applying appropriately, and I'm running out of time, here what they do is that they transfer their new knowledge to produce a similar multimodal artifact or a printed text similar to the one that was presented. And in applying creatively, they create, they, they take new knowledge one step forward. They, they, they think outside the box. And here, what I'm going to show you is the way in which you can do that. So in applying appropriately and creatively, uh, you can have students complete a variety of collaborative digital um, multimodal projects. For example, videos, podcasts, vlogs, brochures, infographics, web pages, blogs, interactive reports, posters, comics, fan fiction, advertisements, commercials, exhibits, cultural designs, digital storytelling, interviews. There's so many different ways in which students can apply knowledge. Now, in this case, we have two projects. So for example, for applying appropriately, students could work in groups with artifacts that are on similar topics. So for example, instead of watching a video, they can read an article, right? So on cultural appropriation in connection with a target cultural group or um, local group or international, okay? And they can, for example, they can compare the new artifact with the original one in terms of the problems that are addressed, the localization and population affected, who is responsible for cultural appropriation and how it affects the populations involved, the ways in which the message is conveyed. So you can have that kind of analysis and that is the applying appropriately. So to show similarities, they can create a spider or conceptual map or a Venn diagram. And then based on their work, students can think of solutions to problems on cultural appropriation for example, what can be done to make people aware of the problem and to help populations affected, right? So that is one way in which students can, uh, can apply appropriately and creatively. Now, in inappropriately, in, in applying a creatively, uh, students can develop an infographic in the target culture to summarize, for example, the information on cultural appropriation from the PBS video. So they can, create an infographic for, for Spanish speaking uh, populations with the definition of cultural appropriation with the aspects of culture um, that are mentioned in the video with the negative consequences. So they can summarize that in a different way. Uh, they can transduce those uh, modes of communications to, uh, to different modes of communication. They can, for example, interview members of the target community and they can document their experiences with cultural appropriation. So for example, they can create a video combining the interviews or they can create a poster, a digital poster based on, info, on the information gathered. They can create an infographic or a digital poster with suggestions for university students on ways to recognize and avoid cultural appropriation with examples from, the target, from target communities. And they can develop a multimodal artifact to highlight how cultural appropriation affects uh, target populations. So in all of these, of course, they would be using the second language, 
but they will be used in the second language in, connections with, in connection with other modes of communication. And I only have, I have very little time, so I'm not going to show you the next, uh, I will share this, but the next are, is just the next three slides are just um, projects that I've done and I've published on the application of, of, um, of learning by design in second language classes to show that it can be done uh, with different levels, you know, beginning intermediate levels, and also um, with uh, mixed Spanish classes and also L2 classes. And now uh, here you have the work cited. Like I said, I'm going to uh, send um, Liana a, the, a copy of this presentation, a PDF copy, all right? So she can share it with all of you and then you can have a look at, at, at the, the things that I haven't presented. And that's it. Thank you so much. Questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gabriela. This was very interesting. Thank you for um, proposing to share the PowerPoint with everybody. We will be certain to do that. A virtual applause. Mm -hmm. Thank, representing. You. Thank you so much. And we have a little bit of time left for questions. If you have mm -hmm. a question, please unmute and ask, unless there is a hand raised. I don't see any hand raised. Or type in the chat, whichever is work, whichever works for you. Okay, let me see. Are there any questions? Yvette, did you have a question? Yes. Um, so Gabriela, I was uh, I was thinking, you know, about this, the interesting about the cultural appropriation. I know, we, well, we work, you know, that we work in Southern California where we have so many uh, Mexican students. How do you think, you know, in the case of the Cinco de Mayo, which is, a, you know, Chicano students or Mexican American students like celebrating that, right? So my, my question is always, how would we have to be always navigating very carefully in this in this moment right um uh, what we present maybe as, as cultural appropriation that can be misunderstood like other students can understand oh, well but that's my culture i can appropriate it if i want right so um, how with this um the multicultural approach um how do you how do you manage it, uh, depending on the setting, on the context where you are um, situated? Yeah, I mean, this is this is just an example, you know. I mean, it's like um, that's the thing, you know. You have to think about and and, and with, in particular, with cultural appropriation. I mean, and that that's the wonderful thing about that PBS video, you know, talking about that. Um, when you think about it, I mean, it depends on you can choose what to that's the beauty of learning by design and that's the beauty of creating your own materials and using authentic materials because you can choose uh, the materials depending on the kind of population that you have, right? And also, you know, when you, so for example, with, um, when you have, you know, Latinx students, I mean, um, it's, it's, it's great because I mean, you can talk about this, you can bring the, you know, the Cinco de Mayo, and then they can have their own, because I mean, that's the whole thing about critical you know, analysis. They can have their own viewpoint. And then how, if they don't see it as cultural appropriation, the reason why, right? So that's the thing, you know, um, but it is important to also think that, you know, when, when you talk about cultural appropriation, it's, uh, it affects people, right? So it's important to also think about that. Okay, how, um, and then is it at the same level? All right, so there are so many different levels in which you can, you can analyze this. And that's the reason why we have analyzing critically, right? Because I mean, is it cultural appropriation? Is it if a white student, for example, use, you know, wears a Mexican sombrero, right? So there's a lot that can go on there, but of course, I mean, it, and that's the whole thing about intercultural citizenship um, and also learning by design is the whole, the, the whole critical approach. It has to be there, but it has to be done in very specific ways and in very uh, careful ways too, right? But there's always um, that particular tension. But if we're going to do intercultural citizenship, we want our students to think critically and to change. And if we're going to have transformation too. So, 
yeah but it depends on who your students are of course i, I always mm -hmm. thank you we are ready for the next question i don't know if i have a question i have more of a comment i i feel lately in our classes um that we have a generation of students that has learned what to say and what's culturally appropriate and what's um what they should be putting forward and i'm I don't know if I'm feeling that lately that I'm getting to them uh, with this kind of conversation or what I get from them is just what they think I'm expecting them to say to us. So uh, I don't know if I'm phrasing the question correctly, but um, yeah, so that that's basically where I am. I don't know if you have the same experience uh, or not. Uh, like, is this politically correctness that they are growing it really making them say things they think we want them to say or are they really critically thinking and coming on up with their own narrative um that's something that's bothering me lately when i'm in a talking about things like this I, um does it make sense <laughs> yes i mean i don't i don't know um it depends on the students, of course, right? Yeah, but it, it's just like it's the, and a lot of times, you know, um, it it has to be personal in mm -hmm. order for them to feel, you know. So that's and that's the thing, you know. That's the that's the thing. It's like you know, coming from where they are and where they and what they know, and then moving forward, you know, with a new particular topic that is connected. Mm -hmm. But I think that I you did know, like that personal connection that you were bringing up instead yes. of just this general, that, you know. Yes, because mm -hmm. I mean, if, if the thing is that if the personal connection is not there, you know, but I do think that this is a generation that is quite, um, quite open when it comes to. I mean, and I love that, you know, and they, they, they are, um, they are very open. They are activists. They are, you know, yes, and. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it has to be, um, it, and that's the thing. They they have to be they have to be interested in what they're saying, in what they are doing, in how they are using the language, you know. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, um, so I'm, I don't know. I mean, I don't have an answer for that. I mean, I think that it it depends so much on who your students are, where they are. I mean, at that particular point. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I do think that we do not we should not shy away from. Oh um, no, absolutely. I'm agreeing. Yeah. But, but it's, it's, it's sometimes I have the feeling it is that feeling of like, are they telling me what they think I want to hear? Or are they really putting forward their own ideas after reflecting yes. on this? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. One more question. Let me see. I don't see anybody asking. I have a oh, question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um I'm wondering how or what experience you have, Gabriela, with providing access points for students who do have a variety of levels of experience with um, intercultural citizenship. Uh, since our, a lot of our classes are requirements, um, we do get a <laughs> wide variety of students coming from a lot of different backgrounds. Um, how do you provide those? points of entry for different levels? I think that, you know, I mean, it's, it's getting to know your students. I mean, and trying to understand, um, it's, it's a combination of what you need to achieve in terms of, you know, your curriculum, but also trying to understand where your students are coming from and trying to get, um, and trying to think of, you know, uh, topics that, 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 that are of interest to uh, most of them, you know. Um, but if you're thinking about students, I mean, and yes, they 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 have different life worlds, but they are things that they share, right? They're all students at USC, so you know that's one thing. Most of them are from California, you know, and there's also the whole idea that they are in in contact with the target communities too. So um, I think that you know it's it's the key is to getting to know your students and then knowing them and then incorporating topics that are of interest to them. Also, the sometimes you know it's like um, it's a question of for them because I mean the important thing is the application of you know the how they apply uh, 
uh, the knowledge. So, and one thing is like, you know, if you think of universal design for learning, it's like, you know, multiple ways of expression. So the whole idea is that, you know, not just having one way of assessing them, but then asking them to do things in different ways in which they can bring their interests. So that sometimes worked too, you know. So having different ways of assessing students and allowing them to create different kinds of projects. So um, within certain, of course, of course, norms and, you know, um, guidelines, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're gonna start wrapping up. Thank you so much, Gabriela, for joining us today. Thank you it's, for inviting uh, me. It's a pleasure to have you back, you know. And um, I hope everybody enjoyed this presentation. And like uh, it was mentioned before, there's a lot to ponder and think about. And um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. I'm gonna yes, thank you. And, and if you have any questions,